Hello and welcome to another episode of Schlock Tactics, the movie podcast where we believe that batter is better and aim to review the pint-sized pieces of trash so that you don't have to. My name is Ash and I'm joined once again by Mark. Oh, hi Mark. Good evening. How are you doing today? Very well. Excellent. Today we will be reviewing two of the Leprechaun uh, movies for you, but before we get to that, I just want to mention the previous episode that we did do. Uh, where we reviewed two video game movies. We had a lot of feedback to this episode before and after we recorded it, so a lot of people seem to have seen both Super Mario Brothers, the movie, and Doom, and people had a lot to say about those. So if you uh, if you like the sound of that, you can go back into our archives and check out our video game movie episode. But today we are going to be reviewing two films from the Leprechaun franchise. Uh, If you've never heard of that before, it's exactly what it sounds like. It is the famous short uh, actor Warwick Davis dressed as a uh, traditional Irish leprechaun uh, tricking people into into mischief and and all sorts of things. So uh, the two movies we're going to be reviewing uh, is Leprechaun 4, subtitle in Space <laughs> from 1996 and also Leprechaun in the Hood from the year 2000. So Mark, I'm obviously plunging you into this franchise here at entry number four. Yeah. Uh, have you ever heard of the Leprechaun franchise, seen any of the other movies? Uh, not seen any of them until yesterday. Probably had a good idea about what they were. Yeah. <laughs> well, I knew Warwick Davis. Yeah. Wasn't it? That was the main was thing working. I knew about Leprechaun. Yeah. Other than that. I knew that there was a different theme for each film. More or less, yeah. That yeah. there were at least a few of them that had been made. Yeah, so if anyone um, doesn't know the Leprechaun franchise, there were, I think to date, there have been seven movies. So just to catch you up, if you're coming in with us, if you're coming in at number four, uh, Leprechaun 1 was, uh, you know, about an, an ancient mythical creature the leprechaun played by Warwick Davis famous short actor Um, he appears in small town America and Jennifer Aniston has to uh, stop him from uh, from unleashing evil on the world in her first credited uh, film Mm. basically repeat that for entries two and three exactly the same plot a leprechaun appears somewhere in America Um, someone has taken his gold or uh, attempted to take his gold and he uh, he kills lots of people that's the plots of a leprechaun one two and three but by 1996 uh, they'd obviously run out of ideas so they did what every horror franchise does when they run out of ideas they went in space (laughs) so that's the first film we're going to talk about now leprechaun four in space from 1996 uh, now this was actually the same year as the Hellraiser franchise went into space as well with Hellraiser also number four actually Hellraiser 4 Bloodline so in exactly the same year both the Hellraiser and Leprechaun franchises completely run out of ideas and decided to set their films largely in space and this is where we find our, our Leprechaun seemingly not related to the first three films or the plots of the first three films set in the year I think 2096 so they've gone they've gone ahead quite a bit into the future which is good actually a lot of sci-fi films don't go that far ahead into the future but 2096 100 years pretty far yeah (laughs) thanks for the maths Mark 100 years into the future 2096 so yeah what were your first impressions then of Leprechaun in Space seeing as you've never seen a Leprechaun film or a Leprechaun in Space well not entirely dissimilar to Doom Um, no (laughs) that is true you just start off with a group of very macho marines in space yeah general cheesiness of it just reminded me of the the way it was the scene was set in doom really yeah this Um, was uh, unintentional really (laughs) i hadn't really planned this but yes this film opens exactly the same way as doom does doom which would be made nearly 10 years after this but i think they both are ripping off aliens which is what they have in common so if you heard our last review of doom and how much that ripped off aliens you're going to get more of that today with leprechaun in space also ripping off aliens and the whole colonial marines dynamic but straight away we open up in space with a a really terrible cgi um spaceship floating throughout space this is like maybe n64 graphics (laughs) maybe playstation 1 graphics this is awful we do as you say we get exactly the same opening as we do to doom we get a a mess hall full of uh, marines you know, they even say Semper Fi, which apparently is the, the motto of the American uh, US Marines. So yeah. straight away, that's exactly what happens in Doom. We get introduced to the sort of leader of this group of Marines, 
I didn't know the character's name at first, so I just wrote down Sergeant Metalhead. And then I looked on IMDb, and the name of the character is Metalhead. <laughs> so they gave this guy, uh, this character, a name which I just thought of in two seconds and wrote down to save time. <laughs> That's what they actually went with. Metal head, uh, so-called because he has half of his head is a shiny chrome plate with some sort of ludicrous putty around the edge <laughs> to make it look like he'd lost a lot of his head yeah. in combat. Also, one of these marines, uh, the character is uh, Styx. It's played by a guy who, apart from Warwick Davis, probably the only kind of name actor in this film is a guy called Miguel Nunez. Um, many of our listeners would know him from Return of the Living Dead, from Friday the 13th, Part 5, and also a film we keep mentioning, Street Fighter the movie. We get a lot of dialogue from this, straight away from this sergeant. You can tell he's going to be a funny character. The stuff he comes out with. Sarge, can I have a word with you for a moment? I'm busy. What the fuck do you want? <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> they, they take the burly sergeant that maybe The Rock played in Doom and kind of turn up the volume even more. Mm. We're introduced to a f- the, the, the lead female character here who is a, uh, a scientist uh, called Dr. Tina. To give her a proper name, Dr. Tina, I think. She's not a real doctor, but she's a doctor of... Yeah, she's, doctor she's got a doctor of biology, up, a biology, yes, probably. Yeah. She's got a doctor up, but she's not an actual doctor, but she's Dr. Tina. Now, weirdly, in this squad, they do already have a female character, but that doesn't stop all of the Marines from being really sexist to this woman <laughs> yeah. doctor. Like, what the hell are you doing here? You know, this isn't this isn't a beauty contest. You yeah. better be prepared to get into combat. I said, like, well, there's a, there's a woman standing right behind you. Well, I guess she's one of the lads. So. I don't understand. Who's going to be the love interest out of these two? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, after we're introduced to all of these Marines, we're sort of introduced to the main villain of the piece, who is kind of a, uh, a mad scientist, a German mad scientist, character called Dr. Mittenhand who is played by a guy called Guy Siner who most people will know from the sitcom Allo Allo uh, where he played a Nazi and he's pretty much playing a Nazi again here mm-hmm. but a, a mad scientist one he's doing the same sort of hammy uh, German accent so we, we know that this is uh, this is going to be sort of our villain as well as the leprechaun in this because he's got a, a sinister edge. He only appears on a TV screen for the first portion of the film, mm. which is worth worth noting. So we do finally um, cut to our leprechaun in his lair with a uh, buxom alien princess called Princess Zarina. Uh, now I looked up uh, this woman and she'd just come off uh, a stint on Baywatch. Ah. So I think you can sort of see she was not necessarily <laughs> she was not hired for her acting ability necessarily, more for her, her Baywatch looks. And mm. uh, if you think I'm joking, she is in a coma for most of the film, <laughs> so she is definitely not hired for her, her acting ability. But she does get some dialogue here at the beginning of the film, and uh, the idea is that the Leprechaun is trying to sort of marry her as some sort of union between Leprechaun and Alien that would create some sort of kingdom yeah. here that he would that he would be able to rule over. Straight away here you're introduced for the first time to Warwick Davis's leprechaun and his roaming Irish accent and all the prosthetics and all the outfit, the whole package. What what did you think of Warwick Davis's leprechaun, this character? It was quite stereotypical. He had a green hat and a green suit. <laughs> <laughs> and little stripy socks yeah. and buckled shoes, yeah. Um Slightly more sort of monstrous face than I was expecting, but yeah. generally quite a, what, what you'd, you'd expect, expect of a yeah. leprechaun. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, ginger <laughs> hair, stripy socks, buckled shoes. Yeah, so sort of, yeah, the prosthetics on his face make his cheeks are sort of like radiators. They're yeah. very lined and that. But um, he's got this this accent. Most of the time, it sounds like him, and you know it's him. But sometimes it'll just veer into Irish just for a moment. Yeah, the bare minimum, and then he'll go back to his own accent. The dialogue of the leprechaun is, is always in, usually in a rhyming pattern, so he'll come out with all these one-liners and make them rhyme. Perhaps he struggled to make them rhyme in an Irish accent, so he dropped the Irish accent a bit. Yeah, <laughs> I, we definitely struggled to do an Irish accent, I can confirm that. But, um, yeah, just as he sort of uh, thinks he's going to get lucky with uh, a beautiful alien princess, all the uh, colonial marines all raid his lair. They blow him to bits with a grenade... Now, something I had to I had to read this on the Wikipedia page. I didn't get this at the time, but after they blow up his his corpse and he's in bits, one of the Marines pisses on him, hmm. and apparently this spirit of the leprechaun enters his dick 
through the urinary tract. I don't know if you noticed this at the time. I, I just to... thought he was getting electrocuted through his urine. Ah. Like, her hand gets blown off, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, her hand gets severed, and then that obviously leads you to the, the groan-worthy line, you know, can you give me a hand? So he chucks the he yeah. chucks his mate, the pro, you know, the prosthetic hand. Ha, ha, ha. One of the guys says, I'd give you a round of applause, but I see you already got the clap. <laughs> so I don't know why I didn't notice this on the on watching it the first time, but yeah, there are all these references to him having a venereal disease <laughs> that somehow transferred from the from the main corpse of a leprechaun into his dick. Yeah. Um, so I just it just passed me by on the first watch, but yeah, you 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 caught it more than I did, maybe. <laughs> so they blow up the leprechaun. Um, this this poor marine gets a. Uh, Gets an STD from the leprechaun corpse. We've all been there. Um, <laughs> but, yeah. Uh, they recover the space princess to their main spaceship. They they put her into a sort of protective bubble wrap um, to make sure she's okay. Uh, all the marines start celebrating in the sort of onboard, like, disco bar area they have on board the ship. A lot of the scenes are filmed in this room. Mm-hmm. It's quite... I quite like this little room. It's like a disco ball and there's, like... 90s Euro dance music and they're all half of them are getting pissed and they're drinking from these like bubbly like ribbed beakers like <laughs> futuristic beakers and they're all have, sort of having a dance and uh, so this guy with the uh, with the supposed STD Kowalski is sort of getting down to business with uh, the female marine who's called Dolores and yeah they're sort of uh, they're getting pretty friendly on the dance floor they're doing busting out their awful mid 90s sort of dance moves and uh, they end up slinking off to get down to business and um, the marines they propose a toast Here's to nasty sex and women who never say no. That's it. Yes, that's the uh, that's the rallying cry of the Marines. That the rapey, disgusting rallying cry of the Marines who've just blown up a leprechaun. Uh, here's to nasty sex and women who never say no. So Kowalski and Dolores they slink off to some boiler room area and start getting really friendly. He comes out with all sorts of doublon tondras regarding oh, his cock yeah. <laughs> stuff like time to shake hands with the big guy yeah yeah and, but then he starts he starts sort of convulsing and she's like well hang on you know I haven't touched you yet and he's like no <laughs> he collapses to the floor and his, his crotch starts bulging yeah and this is this is a clear alien I think reference mm. uh, where you think he's going to have an alien burst out of his pants but then what ends up happening you know re the uh, previous infection is that the leprechaun bursts out of his dick <laughs> So through through him urinating on the corpse of the maimed leprechaun, the leprechaun was able to manifest inside his dick, get back to the, to the space station, and then burst out of his crotch. And if that wasn't weird enough, then the uh, leprechaun starts uh, uh, brandishing a pistol and putting on a John Wayne accent, doing an impression, and uh, having a bit of a shootout with Dolores, the, uh, the Marine. So this was just a whole weird sequence. Dick bursting, John Wayne... <laughs> Homage. There's sort of an assistant doctor to the mad scientist called Harold, and um, he's got these sort of massive round glasses on. Straight away, he looks pretty sleazy, and yeah, he starts sort of perving around with the um, unconscious space alien, thinking mm-hmm. he's gonna he's gonna have a go. Um, he notices that her hand has started has regenerated since she's been in the bubble wrap, and then yeah, Doctor Mittenhand sort of on a TV screen wheels in in the background and interrupts him about to rape an unconscious woman <laughs> it's a common theme here um, and he sort of interrupts him and says I know what you're doing <laughs> uh, that's, that's pretty funny uh, at this point all of the marines sort of um, uh, burst in here and say like you know something's going on some, my, some of my men are dead you know we, we brought something back with us like aliens and mitten hand is you know there's this whole thing where the marines say well our contract expires at midnight after that we're getting off the space station yeah. Um, Dr. Mittenhand says, well, no, you're not. I'm going to extend your contract. There's some quite dull bureaucratic contract negotiations yeah. for a while. <laughs> and you're thinking, oh. And just when you're starting to get bored, Dr. Mittenhand um, comes out from behind his, his quarters and you discover that he's a cyborg. Mm. He's sort of a bald-headed man with a bit of a chest and an arm. Again, quite poorly putty moulded over this sort of really cheap-looking toaster on wheels yeah. sort of device like a really shit Dalek mostly android with a bit of human yeah but it's just like tacky electronics 
really crap looking effects like it's beyond B movie like Z movie is this sort of plastic toaster on wheels with this putty <laughs> moldler on the top and then just like this bald middle aged guy sort of shirtless on top <laughs> it looked pretty dreadful there was more contract negotiations and eventually it was negotiated that the marines would stay on in order for some sort of percentage of precious minerals extracted from the cave Mm. I was just fucking really bored at this point. Like, <laughs> enough of the um, the contract negotiations, let's get on with the movie. And uh, they did do that, so the job of the Marines now is to, to search and destroy mission, is to find the leprechaun on board and destroy it. Again, this is what happens in Alien and Aliens, mm. probably every Alien film. But at least at least we know where we're going here with the plot, and we know our villain is, is Dr. Mittenhand, and it's also the leprechaun, so we... We get a bit of clarity here about what what is going to go on in this uh, in this film. Now, a, a common theme in all of the Leprechaun films is this sort of uh, mischief. He's not like a super evil monster. He's more of a mischievous monster. Hmm. So we get he pops up on a TV here and gives a safety demonstration. So he's wearing a hard hat and he's talking about be careful with sharp objects when you're in the workplace. <laughs> And he cuts off his fingers with scissors and then lights it with a lighter and then it's got like a f- like flaming candle fingers. I was quite confused about this, what this was. He said, as Shakespeare said, shit happens. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, and then it goes immediately from this weird video where he's cutting off his fingers to quoting Shakespeare, but not really. Uh, and then singing Danny Boy whilst tapping <laughs> on some pipes with his fingernails bizarre little scene here we get a couple of these scenes just where lots of weird stuff happens in a row and you, you're wondering what the what the hell's going on we get a scene with dr mittenhand and harold again where we get actually a, a weird attempt at character development um where he talks about that you know he was some sort of experiment gone wrong sort of an early foray into cybernetics once upon a time he was a quite a dashing young man and that's what he wants again is to be a handsome young man again so I was yeah. I was quite impressed with his backstory <laughs> and character development I wasn't wasn't expecting any <laughs> any of that in this film the marines eventually pin down the leprechaun on some sort of um, walkway and he's blown up again I think again by a grenade um, so it's a common thing in this in this film is the leprechaun constantly getting blown up into pieces uh, this time, um, Dolores, who's still surprisingly around, giving the finishing blow here, but pretty soon he, he sort of... <laughs> all that's left are his feet and his socks, and from that he regenerates really quickly into a full full leprechaun again. Yeah. I say full, he's three foot tall, but that's him. Um, so he regenerates, but, and one of my favourite things about the leprechaun movies is that he has a shillelagh. Uh, what is a leprechaun without a shillelagh? <laughs> so he starts twatting this this woman with his shillelagh until she's hanging off of the the walkway, and uh, eventually she she plunges to her death, which is quite fun. Still, the object of the leprechaun is to get the space princess. Whilst all these marines are hunting him down because their orders are to kill the leprechaun, his main objective is to find uh, Princess Zarina because that's still his ticket to sort of marrying into a intergalactic royal family. Mm. It's ridiculous as that sounds. <laughs> um, so he needs to get into the med bay, really, and that's being sort of guarded by um, by Harold, the pervy doctor. He disguises himself as Dr. Tina, the biologist, um, but completely naked out in the, in the hallway, and he's able to mimic her voice, but she's still talking in a weird sort of Irish accent. Yeah. As if to convince this pervy doctor to open the door so that she can presumably have sex with him. And this kind of comes back in in the hood as well. But we'll talk about that later. Yeah. But not naked, but just... The ability to mimic... A woman. Women in particular <laughs> to manipulate men. Yeah. yeah. I guess it's it's too easy, isn't it, to mm. to manipulate men just by mimicking a beautiful woman? But as soon as this this Harold opens the door, he gets a shillelagh right to the dick, <laughs> which was funny. Um, just hits the deck. <laughs> <laughs> shillelagh stays there, just a shillelagh embedded in his nuts. <laughs> and then we get a leprechaun and Doctor Mittenhand, the Nazi scientist. They have their little showdown, and it's quite interesting because there's two villains of the film sort of confronting each other and having all of their motivation come out and they're clashing 
yeah. and you get Dr. Mittenhan saying, no, well, we're both monsters in a way. We just, maybe we look a bit different. We've come from different backgrounds, maybe. But, you know, we're really both monsters. Dr. Harold recovers from the shillelagh to the dick, walks in, and the leprechaun throws a tray at his head <laughs> and this leaves him with this completely flat head. Oh, yeah. And this is where some great, like, actually probably the best effect in the film is this bit where his face is just completely flat 2D big moon face <laughs> looks like one of the mutants out of uh, Basket Case 2 yeah <laughs> yeah he really does yeah this is again proper rubbery latex effects but in 1996 when this is very much the the last call for these kind of effects but mm. Yeah, so really the leprechaun gets the better of Dr. Mittenhand and you see him, so he ties him up and he detains him and you see him getting a blender in which he pours DNA juice, which is like bright blue and then he puts a spider in there and then he puts a scorpion in there <laughs> and I think you can see where this is going. Spider, scorpion, slush puppy which is administered via injection directly into the top of the skull. Yeah, that's the end of Dr. Mittenhand <laughs> for now. Obviously, you can imagine he's going to be making a comeback. So uh, the leprechaun does get possession of Princess Serena. She wakes up and she seems to be okay with going off with this leprechaun. She's resigned to her forced sort of arranged marriage here. Uh, they try and make a run for it. Uh, but then the Marines end up cornering Princess Serena and they try and sort of tell her, you know, look, this this leprechaun is evil, don't listen to him. Her response to that is to get her tits out. <laughs> I'm not joking. She gets her tits out. This was so random. I just don't, <laughs> I don't understand. <laughs> I mean, they hired this woman that had been on Baywatch. I guess they were going to get they were going to get their yeah. money's worth here, so <laughs> she literally gets her tits out. Uh, all of the marines are slack-jawed. She walks off and then Dr. Tina points out that well, no, when when one of these aliens shows you their tits, it's actually a death sentence. <laughs> Oh, I should have known. And again, the Marines don't seem to mind that. They're like, well, that's yeah. fine. That's fine. Yeah. <laughs> At least I saw some tits. It was so worth it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what is, a, what is a horror B movie without some tits? So there you go. You get this probably about an hour and ten minutes into the film. <laughs> if you stuck around for an hour and ten, you do get to see this, uh, this Baywatch uh, star's tits. There you go. It's at this point that, that Sergeant Metalhead comes under the um, mind control of the Leprechaun, and this is, like you say, this is something that comes up uh, again in Leprechaun in the Hood, but he comes under the, the, the mental control of the Leprechaun. The next time you see the Sarge, he is dressed in drag and performing a dance number in the nightclub. Again, a weird trope of these leprechaun movies is yeah. is transvestites yeah. and men in drag <laughs> perhaps a little bit dated as that's not that funny anymore no. but at the time I guess it was they thought it would be funny so here is this big butch marine in drag and like a curly wig doing some sort of dance number this is when we see mitten hand revealed he declares himself no longer mitten hand but mitten spider mm. uh, because he's turned into a sort of a goblin that's got a spider body and a scorpion tail really messy practical effects here I didn't think this looked very good at all somehow this looked worse than, than when he was a cyborg so he's doing his thing trying to self destruct the spaceship while that's happening Dr. Tina is having a fight with the sergeant who is in drag again it's ho horribly uh, dated he's pretending to be a butch marine soldier on your feet and then he'll sort of go ah, and he'll turn to the side and go oh but my nails and then he'll switch back oh I'm going to kick your ass oh, but I don't want to it's this horrible like really base like gender um, based comedy which yeah. is, just looks hideous now uh, but this is the joke they're going for is that this butch marine who is uh, also in drag is having some sort of massive identity crisis but then eventually the, he, he falls over and, it, and his metal plate falls off and you realise he was been a cyborg all along. Yeah. He was never a human. <laughs> to which they say, well, he, he might have been a cyborg, but he was a goddamn good Marine. <laughs> to which they just move on. <laughs> That's good enough. Thanks for clarifying. The Princess Serena is starting to get a bit big for her boots, so the leprechaun um, sort of puts, puts a curse on her 
which just involves her getting a few spots on her face, yeah. which now means that she's completely ugly to all of the human race. And I was just thinking to myself, I'm sure these marines would still jump on her if they had the chance. <gasps> this, this, these couple of spots on her head is not not too bad, actually. She's in distress because she's got some zits on her face. Uh, this time, they accidentally turn the... Um, the expansion ray, I suppose you could call it. It basically turns into Honey, I Blew Up the Leprechaun. <laughs> when they accidentally turn this laser on him and he becomes, like, what, 20 foot tall? Yeah. In the cargo bay of this spaceship. It's mm-hmm. like, oh, I see. Usually he's a little small monster, but now he's massive. Yeah. I see what you've done there. <laughs> yeah. Um, so it turns into a bit of a kaiju film for about 10 minutes where, <laughs> where there's loads of miniatures around him and he's still the leprechaun still looks exactly the same in the same dress but they've put loads of tiny little egg cartons around him to make it look like these crates that were previously towering over him are now you know nothing so Mm. we get a a good knob joke another knob joke where uh, as soon as he's become expanded by their ray he he has a peek down his pants and I think he says bigger is better (laughs) So again, lots of dick jokes in these movies if you enjoy those, which which I do. Dr. Mittenhand ends up getting frozen by Dr. Tina and shattered into little pieces a la Terminator. They end up being able to jettison the leprechaun into outer space and the film sort of ends with just a massive floating leprechaun hand flipping them the middle finger from outside of the cargo bay. <laughs> and that's it. And that was that. That's leprechaun in space. Yeah, what what were your overall impressions of Leprechaun in space, in yeah. isolation from the rest of the franchise, which you haven't seen? <laughs> I quite enjoyed it. There were some good lines, obviously lots of ridiculousness, but it was needlessly drawn out in parts. And <laughs> Pretty low budget. I think it was made for TV. I yeah. think both of these films were, but this one more obviously. <laughs> the budget was, was minuscule. I think this film was at its best where you were getting the funny one-liners from the, um, the sergeant who actually was in Full Metal Jacket. He, he didn't have a credited role. He was just gunner in air, in helicopter. But he yeah. was in a proper war film, uh, Full Metal Jacket. Again, you have this guy that was in Allo Allo, who is probably a pretty good actor usually, but he was brought in to be a pantomime villain. And you get Warwick Davis again doing his thing as the leprechaun. This is his fourth film at this point. And he still seems to be having quite a good time with it. Mm. I mean, obviously, back then, there weren't necessarily the roles for, for little people and little actors as there are now, with people like Peter Dinklage just getting normal, normal characters and <clears throat> yeah. not necessarily revolve around being small. No. Um, Warwick Davis obviously came in a time before that where he was forced to play goblins, leprechauns, Ewoks, anything that required someone that was around, around three foot tall. But yeah. I think he made the best of it. And a lot of the times he was, certainly in this franchise, he was the highlight in this film I think he was still able to have fun with it just lots of wringing his hands and looking to the camera cracking a sort of a, a Schwarzenegger one liner and chuckling and wandering off again like it was it was pretty fun yeah I thought uh, just suffered from a real small budget and um, being another Aliens knock off again mm. we keep we keep getting him I'm sure this won't be the, the last it's not the first <laughs> uh, we're going to keep getting these Aliens rip offs and that just just shows you what a great film Aliens is and if you know, if anyone listening hasn't seen Aliens, watch that first, please, before <laughs> watching any of these films. Because, <laughs> you know, a lot of things came from that film, good and bad. Um, but a lot of them included, you know, hunting a monster around a space station, <laughs> which which is the plot of many, many films. So, yeah, that was Leprechaun in Space from 1996. And now we move on a couple of years to Leprechaun in the Hood from the year 2000. So I guess this is technically Leprechaun 5. But thank God they've stopped numbering them by this point. They've just they just left called Leprechaun in the Hood. So really, this is sort of cashing in on the early to mid '90s wave of black exploitation films like Boys in the Hood, Menace to Society, even stuff like Friday and Next Friday. It's cashing in on those kind of films quite late in the day. You know, the year 2000. Those, those films had already had kind of had their wave of popularity, but. Yeah. They thought, what better setting to insert the leprechaun into than Compton uh, mm-hmm. into a kind of black exploitation gangster rap film? 
even though that sounds like a terrible idea, it actually turned out to be a brilliant idea, yeah. um, which made for a lot, of, a lot of hilarity. So again, Warwick Davis reprises his role. Um, weirdly, this film kind of picks up from where Leprechaun Three left off. Obviously, because Leprechaun in Space was set in 2096, it's not referenced at all here. Mm-hmm. That's yet to happen. Happens way in the future. So we kind of pick up from Leprechaun 3, where the Leprechaun has become a statue, imprisoned in a statue by a medallion. And that's the kind of, that's his sort of state where he can stay for decades if, if need be. Uh, the other star of this film, big name, is Ice T. You know, very famous rapper had already been in a few shit films by this point. So this is not his first rodeo. Uh, he wasn't above this kind of film by this point. Certainly not. Um, we open with a little prologue of him discovering the Leprechaun statue. And in case you were a bit confused, wondering what kind of time frame it was after watching Leprechaun in Space, luckily he's got an afro and flares on, <laughs> so you know exactly where we are. We're in the seventies, I believe. We're in New York because we can hear like the subway and stuff. Him and his friend discover the Leprechaun statue. Now, Ice-T is more interested in the leprechaun's flute. I'm not making a dick joke, although many other people will, (laughs) about the flute, but um, this is going to be the only genuine (laughs) reference to a flute, maybe, in this film. (laughs) Uh, Ice-T wants the flute, but his mate wants the medallion, and before he can stop him, we discover that taking the medallion off of the leprechaun results in the leprechaun being brought back to life. Mm-hmm. He's referred to here as uh, Midget Midas Motherfucker <laughs> by Ice-T. One of the many great lines that Ice-T has. His his uh, his companion sadly gets an afro pick through the neck, <laughs> murdered, which leads to a, a great scene where, where Ice-T is, gets into a fight with a leprechaun and he starts pulling weaponry out of his massive afro. <laughs> a flick knife, a baseball bat, this was brilliant. Just to confirm that it's this is definitely a seventies film. This is definitely <laughs> yeah. We start off with seventies black exploitation before we go into the nineties black exploitation. Yeah. There's a little nod to the classic uh, black exploitation films. Uh, he manages to get the medallion back onto Leprechaun, which turns him to stone. That's where the Leprechaun will be left for well, I would say twenty years or so. And um, when we fast forward to the modern day. Obviously, it's not the 70s anymore. We are in modern-day Compton. We're in the height of gangster rap. We are introduced to our our heroes of the film, if you like, our protagonists, who are this rap trio made up of Postmaster P, the P stands for positive, (laughs) Stray Bullet, and the DJ, DJ Butch. So this is our sort of trio of uh, of rappers here who are trying to make you know trying to make it big they're trying to be the next big thing in in hip hop you start to get the sense really early on in this film that a lot of the laughs here are going to be coming from these characters just sort of going motherfucker yeah. and stuff like that in true black exploitation style it's just going to be all these black characters saying things like shit shit dog motherfucker <laughs> What the fuck is up with you? And, you know, the, all this sorts of this vernacular that you're really expecting from a name like Leprechaun in the Hood, and you get loads of that, and it's always pretty, pretty funny. These three are having their sort of audition to try and get to this rap competition, and they mess it up, so they're they're out, uh, they're out of it. Their, their equipment blows up, and it's because I think the DJ is sort of an amateur chemist, an amateur sort of alchemist. He he he, he messed up the formula. <laughs> I'm not sure what was going on here. But he blows up their equipment, so they fail their audition, and they also need some more equipment. So they end up going around the pawn shop with a guitar that they claim belongs to Jimi Hendrix, or did belong to Jimi Hendrix. And it's been signed by Jimi Hendrix in 1971. Just after he died. Everybody knows he died in 1970, or everybody in this film does anyway. Um, So they, they fail miserably. And the guy tries to claim that it was Paul McCartney or something. Yeah, he says, okay, no, it wasn't Jimi Hendrix then, it was Paul McCartney. Uh, he so, says to the pawn shop guy, what what will you give me? And he says, I'll give you five seconds to get out of my shop. <laughs> <laughs> so that's another one of his great lines. So they bump into uh, Mac Daddy, this is Ice T's character. 20 years into the future from our prologue, he's become a very rich and successful um, record producer, owns a record label, seems to be a pimp on the side. Mm. I'm not sure what's going on there. <laughs> um, but straight away you see the flute that he got at the beginning of the film and a bracelet around his, his wrist. So you start to get the idea that, ah, this flute is maybe important and it's got, got some magical powers. So Mac Daddy gives the, our, our heroes an audition, uh, an audience, in his in his offices. And um, when we get into the offices, we see 
the stone statue of the leprechaun right there uh, encased in in glass and they start sort of eyeing up the medallion they start eyeing up all of his his flute again not a dick joke not yet bear with me we get a very entertaining uh, phone conversation here did you did you catch any of this dialogue this Go is ahead. where he's on the phone to somebody and he says I hope you had sex last night because I'm going to come round and cut your dick off oh yeah <laughs> uh, amongst <laughs> other hilarious dialogue he's uh, very angry and he does <clears throat> not like their positive music he's a gangster motherfucker and, yeah uh, I mean true true to Ice-T in real life he is a gangster rapper so I don't know why he's, he's more or less playing himself uh-huh. he's telling them you know you need to be gangster you need to talk about Uzis and AK-47s mm-hmm. and smacking your bitch up <laughs> that's a quote smacking your bitch up and um, Postmaster P P stands for positive says no we're about positivity and spreading a positive message that's the kind of vibe we're going for so they were like a De La Soul yeah. kind of hip hop group where Ice-T obviously wants like an NWA or Ice-T yeah. <laughs> we're not going to mention that but that's pretty much what he wants somebody's going to talk about bitches and hoes and putting a cap in your ass so they, they have this sort of moral dilemma as oh do we do we change our positive message and talk about shooting each other just to get a record deal or will that be setting a, a bad example for the black community this is as, as lofty as this film gets in <laughs> yeah. terms of its in terms of its plot <laughs> we don't really return to this they, they basically get told to get out because they take too long to decide whether they want to be gangster or you know De La Soul type rappers Stray Bullet who is probably the most gangster of the three comes up with the uh, the idea that they will break in to uh, Mac Daddy's office steal the medallion we all saw the medallion on the weird little statue here uh, mm. that looks like it's worth quite a lot and it also looks like it's stolen so if we nick it we can sell it and he won't call the police mm-hmm. is the idea so they hatch this kind of plot again Postmaster P remains the kind of moral compass here he's not sure about stealing even from a uh, even from a gangster to which Butch says no we'll be like Robin Hood mm. but Robin the Hood <laughs> maybe a bit of a sublime reference there so they eventually decide they will try and rob Mac Daddy because he's had a terrible effect on the black community. We should really sort him out. <laughs> so they decide they're going to do that. They break in, they steal the medallion which brings the leprechaun back to life. They shoot Mac Daddy in the chest so he's presumably dead. And the last second, they nick the flute off of his wrist. So they've got the flute, they've got the medallion, Mac Daddy is dead and the leprechaun is on the loose. It's quite a lot of plot to unleash in one in one scene, yeah. but this really uh, this really sets the scene for the rest of the film here. Shortly after the leprechaun is unleashed, he catches up with Ice T, sort of haunts Ice T, um, Mac Daddy. He goes to a, a club bathroom. He's trying to get himself straight, and the leprechaun sort of haunts him and says, "You, I'm going to kill you unless you get my my flute back and my medallion back and well not the medallion because that would freeze him again but get my treasure back or I'll kill you and he rips his finger off just to make a point and he gets high in the process yeah and then there's this brilliant <laughs> scene I mean you can kind of see it coming ice tea is like oh man I've got to relax you know I'm I'm seeing leprechauns in mirrors I need to, <laughs> I'm, I'm bugging out I need to relax so he smokes up and then the leprechaun appears and sort of looks at it and goes that's an interesting aroma. <laughs> um, obviously, he's never encountered weed before, so Ice T lets him have a go on on his joints, and he's like, "Oh, that's 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 not bad." Mm. And Ice T, yeah, so it's it's the bomb. <laughs> he goes, "Oh, the bomb, is it? Oh, <laughs> very good." So yeah, so now the leprechaun is getting into weed. This begins the leprechaun sort of transition into uh, into a sort of a pimp gangster rap character, which will end up with toward the toward the later part of the film so there you get the impression that you know ice T he's got to get this flute back from our crew otherwise the leprechaun will kill him he can't be sort of plied with weed forever he will he will kill again and he will come after ice T if he doesn't sort this out again we get this weird transvestite kind of element coming into the film which is a, again a pr- a kind of uncomfortable to watch nowadays but we get a man dressed as a prostitute and that's obviously meant to be hilarious but the, our crew go and stay with this uh, this person they end up giving a performance um, in, the, in, in the back of the street and once again we just get this sort of black guy come out on his balcony and just go motherfucker <laughs> Will you shut the fuck up and stuff like that? And they're like, "What? What do you mean? We're doing our we're doing our performance." <laughs> He's like, 
you sound terrible and he starts yeah. chucking glass bottles at him <laughs> and then they entrance him with the flute and he just completely changes yeah. into this kind of <clears throat> dreamy state and <laughs> so this is where we really get the idea that the flute is enchanted and you can charm whoever basically whoever you want to enjoy your music you play them a little blast of the flute Mm. and they'll enjoy whatever you do after that yeah which is a weird weird rules that are in place here but they they start to sound a bit better as well as if it's actually they do (laughs) yeah yeah. they start to get some better lyrics and and beats and stuff like that Um, maybe we were falling under the spell of the flute ourselves (laughs) but is that um, the whole spiel of the (laughs) film I don't know yeah maybe I could tell that this was a really good performance in the street by the fact that in the foreground of the shot you could see an old white guy with grey hair and a polo shirt having a good dance to this rap music so it must be good if this old white guy is really enjoying it (laughs) Um, but the leprechaun ends up sort of infiltrating the apartment here so we get a dick joke here with the flu. We've been waiting a while for this. The leprechaun comes into the apartment and says to the hooker, you know, I'm after me enchanted flute. And then, you know, she says something along the lines of, I've, I've heard some names for it. You know, that, that kind of, that carry on gag, you know, that you were just waiting for in this film. Um, he does away with, with this hooker character. Uh, it all goes a bit home alone for a while. DJ Butch, who we've established as the kind of clever-ish um, scientist character, comes up with... Um, sort of getting a bit of kitchen towel and smearing it in KY jelly (laughs) turning it into a bit of like a Molotov he hooks it up to the plug and if you turn the lights on it will it will turn this kitchen roll into like a flaming trap yeah so he says you know you stand over there by the light switch get ready to flip the switch and then um, you go and and get distract him get him to come in so he opens the door and just says hey shorty my dick is bigger than you (laughs) which is another, you know, again, dick jokes are coming thick and fast. I like it. Um, the leprechaun comes in, they set him on fire with this homemade sort of booby trap. It's pretty good. And that's the leprechaun out of action for a little bit. The film starts kind of roaming wildly by this point. They're sort of talking about what they're going to do next. Are they going to sell some more merchandise? Are they going to get some guns? How are they going to kill Mac Daddy? And Postmaster P just says, hang on, I need to go to my grandma's house. I need to make sure she's all right what (laughs) so the film just takes a massive like downturn in momentum when they just go to his grandma's house and she makes them some soup (laughs) and they eat some soup for a bit and talk about what they're going to do next it's very strange this is real padding surely they just didn't Uh, know what to put in there it's got to be they don't know how to get to the next bit they've just set the leprechaun on fire so they can't use him for at least five minutes yeah Uh, (laughs) the grandma is blind so we get this joke of her not realising when people are in the room and mistaking people for other people and you kind of know where this is going to go as well again more padding they end up in the hiding out in the church and the reverend there says well you know our musical a- act have cancelled this morning so would you mind performing a rap song for the church this doesn't sound like a very good idea <laughs> but um, but they do it anyway it's kind of amusing he, <clears throat> one of them starts a line and the other one tries to end it without offending <clears throat> all of these people in church yeah. and it's these boys that are sort of good church going lads but at the same time they're gangster rappers yeah where, like you say, one of them starts off saying, Jesus loves me, this I know. Yeah. And then the other one finishes it, but if he doesn't, I'll find a hoe. <laughs> <laughs> and again, it kind of goes from there. So it's this weird mixture of gospel and gangster rap that I, I quite enjoyed. Though yeah. this was their best work in the film. I, I, I could have done with more of this. So obviously, the, the, the congregation get up and they're outraged. How can he talk about hoes and. Mary Jane and all this sort of stuff this disgusting gangster rap we're trying to get away from this in the hood but just as they get up of course Postmaster P pulls out the magic flute again and you, you get the sense of starting to rely on this too much this is probably going to go wrong soon yet again entrancing everyone yeah he plays a tune on the flute and the flute is so powerful that it manages to summon Coolio for a completely unexplained cameo <laughs> They're just they're playing in front of this church, and one of them stops and goes, "Hang on, is that Coolio? <laughs> I just, was he meant to be in this film, or was he just on set at the time and he just wandered into the back of the shot?" So brief. It's amazing. I, I mean, Ice T. You already had Ice T. I don't think you needed Coolio as well. No. But yeah, all of a sudden, Coolio's in the background, doesn't get any dialogue, <laughs> just bobs his head to this gospel for two seconds, blasphemous so. rap, and that's it. That's your Coolio um, cameo. Good, good for you. <laughs> Again, they're starting to try to figure out how they're going to 
avoid, you know, being killed by either Mac Daddy or the Leprechaun, two people after them. Butch mentions, you know, this could be the key to our coffin, which begs the question, what what coffin have you seen that's got a lock and a key? Why would you need a key for a coffin? Nobody's trying to get in or out. I think they're trying to be clever with the dialogue and it just failed. <laughs> yeah. They end up being able to trap the leprechaun inside the safe of the reverend, but from inside the safe, the leprechaun sort of mumbles something about, that's oh, okay, I'll get me zombie fly girls to come out. <laughs> so again, you get a bit more of what you've got in Leprechaun in Space, the, the leprechaun's ability to possess and summon people under his own command. So we get these girls in sort of gold jumpsuits with sunglasses on, but if you pull their sunglasses down, you'll see piercing green eyes, which tells you that they're under the control of a leprechaun. There's a funny bit where one of these girls comes into the church and the reverend gets really pervy. He's like, let me lay hands upon you, child. <laughs> and he's getting all, like, pervy and rapey. But luckily the, 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 the leprechaun disembowels him from behind, just rips all his guts out. Quite lazy killings. Most of the leprechaun killings are him just blowing people's guts out from behind. Yeah kind of lazy budget I suppose so yeah the, the our, our rap crew get another audition they nail it this time probably because of the flute and they realise that they're, they're going to go to Las Vegas to compete in this competition you know thank god for that but before that can happen they're, they're confronted by the, the zombie hoes who uh, who come in and also the um, leprechaun he comes to get his flute back he, he's able to um, make them point the gun at each other and point the gun at themselves, and unfortunately, this is the end of yeah. of Stray Bullet. Forces yeah. him to shoot himself through the head, and that's the end of Stray Bullet. So it's just Postmaster P and Butch now. We're we're getting down. Butch comes around, and he's he's rented, presumably he's rented from the library, Leprechauns for Dummies book, and he's discovered that the the best way to to kill a leprechaun or to overcome a leprechaun is to to give it a four leaf clover. So he's come up with a special type of weed. Which mm. contains four leaf clover. So if we can get him to smoke this, we'll we'll be able to get a medallion on him, freeze him again for all time. It's a pretty good plan. But how are they going to get to him to smoke weed? They're going to have to dress up as women. <laughs> Once again, we're going to have to get male characters to dress up as women. Seduce him, and um, not just women, hoes. Yeah, they have to yeah. dress up as hoes. So they they dress up all all tarty, loads of makeup and um, you know short skirts and stuff, and uh, they are able to to get him to smoke this weed. He's able to to kill Mac Daddy, Postmaster P. Unfortunately, um, Butch gets killed in the process, but mm. but Postmaster P is able to shoot Mac Daddy. Him and the Leprechaun have this weird rhyme off where he starts rapping in an Irish accent. <laughs> it's very odd. Yeah, eventually they manage to get the medallion back on him. He's frozen again in time. We cut to Postmaster P in his successful solo career <laughs> on stage. Loads of people cheering him on in a suit. He's sort of he's made it big as a solo rapper. But then he flicks down the sunglasses and he's got green eyes. So he's actually under the control of the leprechaun. Indeed. And to close the film, we get probably the only bit worth watching in the film, the leprechaun rap. (laughs) And people might have seen this without seeing the film. I'll paraphrase here. I come from the land of the Irish Spring. Dublin's the place where I learned my thing. (laughs) From the Emerald Isle to your place in the hood, I'm a man of green comes to do no good. (laughs) Blunt is dope, this place is hype. There's a lassie, she's just my type. I hate to resort so soon to magic, but I haven't been laid so long, it's tragic. (laughs) I'll show what to do, so lend an ear. Don't worry, little lassie, you've got nothing to fear. Sit with a lad who's lean and green, and let me show you why I'm a love machine. (laughs) And then just repeatedly, Lep in the Hood, Come to Do No Good. The, the girls are dancing, Lep in the Hood. The credits start to roll. And you think, oh, I, 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 I could do with more of this, actually. It's yeah. pretty good, you know. Um, so that's the, that's the Leprechaun rap. I would recommend looking that up on YouTube if you don't want to watch the whole film. I, I understand. But that's it, Leprechaun in the Hood. Uh, what were your overall thoughts on Leprechaun in the Hood, Mark? I quite enjoyed it. I liked the change of setting. <clears throat> from space I was it really once, worked bizarrely yeah. yeah once I was introduced at the beginning of the film I was like oh this is cool urban America rappers yeah leprechaun smoking dope this is it's so crazy fun. that it might work yeah, yeah. it's good yeah. fun it's an odd setting for a horror film or a B movie certainly for a leprechaun film yeah again lots of cheesy dialogue but also similarly to leprechaun in space there were a lot of scenes which were kind of 
drawn out and you're like what's going on here <laughs> does this need to be happening <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah unnecessary plot but generally good fun yeah <laughs> yeah a lot more fun wasn't it you know yeah I love the setting of it being in the hood it's such a weird juxtaposition to have a horror or a B movie set in in Compton yeah. in, in kind of uh, that black exploitation kind of hood setting and, and it makes for a lot, a lot of fun you know stuff like the leprechaun discovering what rap is mm. later becoming a rapper becoming a pimp smoking his first joint <laughs> it's just lots of lots of interesting juxtaposition that makes it yeah, a lot of fun um, yeah leprechaun in the hood I, I would recommend that they did follow up with uh, leprechaun back to the hood a couple of years later I haven't seen that but I, I would like to and then, yeah, eventually the the series would be rebooted with Leprechaun Origins, uh, which featured WWE star Hornswoggle. <laughs> I've got my wrestling reference in there right <laughs> at the end of the show. And uh, apparently next year there's going to be another Leprechaun film. I think Leprechaun Returns, something like that. So this is a franchise started in the early 90s, just Warwick Davis playing a funny little Leprechaun. And it, it's still still going now. A surprising longevity, you know, <laughs> seven or eight films. Not sure if Warwick Davis will be in the uh, next one, though. No, I think <laughs> Warwick Davis is out of the Leprechaun game now. I think he's uh, um, excelled past the... Uh... <laughs> yeah, but he had fun with it. He did, you know, he did six Leprechaun films. Yeah. I'm, I'm sure he's played a goblin in certain films. He obviously played Willow, which was sort of a magical dwarf. Um, he played an Ewok in a couple of films, like... He may have been typecast into, you know, small person roles, and, but he's done quite well out of it. And mm. I think when you think of a short person uh, actor, you think of Warwick Davis and, you know, he's he's made a definitive career out of it. So I, uh, a lot of respect for Warwick Davis. He, th- he threw it all into these performances when he was being asked to play a leprechaun for the fifth time yeah. in a row. He still did quite a good job of it and, and, and went for it, which I, which I love. Mark, if you had to put a medallion over one of these films and freeze it for all eternity, or if you had to smoke a joint with one of these films, <laughs> which one would you freeze? Which one would you smoke a joint with? I think I'd freeze the, uh, the space yeah, and uh, smoke a joint with uh, the hood. <laughs> smoke a joint in the hood. <laughs> smoke a joint in the hood <laughs> with the leprechaun. With the leprechaun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Me too. Yeah, uh, a lot um, of the leprechaun in space was just too far fetched, even for a leprechaun film. Really, I enjoyed it, but it was just I mm-hmm. felt like it fitted better being in yeah. kind of yeah. Compton. They've obviously run out of ideas massively, but weirdly enough, a leprechaun in Compton worked really well and yeah. it was really fun. And yeah, wasn't was never really a dull moment in this film, really. So yeah, I agree. I would I would love to smoke a joint with a leprechaun in the hood, and uh, we'll leave the uh, the leprechaun in space up there in space, <laughs> floating around in bits as he probably still is. So yeah, those were two of the uh, the better films from the Leprechaun franchise. Um, if you enjoyed both of those, of course there are quite a few other Leprechaun films <laughs> you could watch. Leprechauns 1 to 3 and a couple after after these as well. If you enjoy horror films going into outer space when they've run out of ideas, like I said, Hellraiser 4 Bloodlines was also set in space because they'd run out of ideas. And also Jason X was Friday the 13th being set in outer space because they'd also run out of ideas after nine films as as you would expect (laughs) Um, if you like the idea of um, horror films being set in sort of the hood uh, there's also the Tales from the Hood franchise if you enjoyed uh, uh, either of these films if you've seen them let us know what you thought of them Uh, if you enjoyed the show do subscribe to us we release two new episodes every month and if you're subscribed you'll be the first one to hear about them Uh, leave us a positive rating in iTunes if you wouldn't mind we are five star rated podcasts and we want to keep that going if you want to uh, leave us any kind of comments or feedback you can follow us on Facebook Instagram and Twitter at Schlock Tactics. Let us know what you thought of the, any of the Leprechaun films. Um, let us know any questions you might have about the incomprehensible plots of these films. <laughs> and if you would like to suggest any films for us to review, then let us know as well on the social media. That has been another episode of Schlock Tactics. My name is Ash and I've been joined once again by Mark. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening, everybody, and we'll catch you next time. Bye. Bye.